morning and welcome to our third and last session on the GAM. My name is still Jörg Müller, uh, together with Sergi Yanis, and this time with uh, Marion from the Gender Academy team, who's hosting us. Um, I think the way to do the session is um, I will, I've prepared a couple of slides on basically how to turn data into insights. Um, during our last session, the idea was that we have set up and prepared everything that you're basically ready to launch uh, a GAM survey. And this time it's gonna be more about, uh, well, once the survey is running and has been and has finished, um, what are the next steps really? Um, I We've set up, during our last uh, our last session, uh, an email list uh, where you can post questions or comments or you know uh, to get help with anything related to doing these uh, surveys. So far, we haven't seen any any movement, which is fine. It's a good sign. I don't know. It's a good sign, or <clears throat> we just didn't have time uh, to work further on it. But anyway, this is. Um, this is going to be active and uh, you can, you know, come back to that uh, in the future whenever you, when that, whenever there really is a need. Um, uh, there will also be, I will make a couple, uh, make a, a short presentation. Then I will show you also um, how you can work with conditions. I think this was a question, an open question that some of you had. So I think it's going to be facilitate <laughs> to work with this uh, more complicated feature of Lyme survey. So how you can, you know, uh, channel and, and uh, um, hide and show question groups of questions. So I give you the basics of this. And then I want to also show you quickly um, how you can make use of the reporting template. I mean, it's a little bit technical, but just, you know, to, to show you that in the end, it shouldn't be that complicated and it's something that actually can be managed. Okay, um, so before we get into the technicalities, I think it's uh, important to emphasize again that uh, um, launching a survey, customizing it, and even then, uh, you know, analyzing and looking at the data shouldn't be, you know, an individual thing that you have to do on your own. In order to really interpret um, the results I think it's really important that you get together with uh, different people, ideally of your self-assessment team that you've established uh, when doing the, the, the gap audit, when starting to really uh, think about a gender equality plan in your institution. I mean, it might be also the, the, the second or third edition of a gender equality plan that you're doing and you want to use it for a monitoring. In any case, I think you probably already will be working um, with uh, the different people involved. So this should be definitely someone from uh, human resources, because usually they have uh, access to the data, for example, on uh, type of contracts uh, or, uh, you know, also distribution of men and women that work in the organization across different staff categories, which then already gives you quite a good um, sense if you contrast your results with uh, their data, you know, how representative really um, the GAM survey results are. There should be different people across the department and faculties because there are always very particular uh, problems. Of course, if you do only the GAM inside a certain department or faculties, you don't need to bring all the others to the table. But still, I think. Um, it makes sense to think about, you know, who should really uh, look at this data. There might also be different associations uh, inside your organization, you know, working groups, interest groups, that um, there should be someone um, looking at the data as well, or of course, then the different staff categories. So if you have someone, you know, from with only temporal contracts or full contracts, their roles, there might be group leaders, uh, students, PhD students, so, you know, um, I think 
you should really uh, assemble those people in order to look together at the data and interpret them what it means inside the organization. And of course, very important then in the end as well, there should be decision makers involved. I mean, there's also always this requirement in a way for doing a gender equality plan that the top management, you know, uh, there's a commitment from top management, but also now uh, in relation to the data, it's important that any findings or suggestions for actions then don't uh, disappear in a drawer, but really, you know, reach the people who are in the position to incorporate this into the organizational strategy, you know, to propose new actions and 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 uh, move something. Another uh, important issue that I want to come back to, um, also, although I already talked about this uh, during the last uh, session, is the issue of confidentiality. Um, I mean, we mentioned this when you collect the data that in principle, the data is anonymous. So you don't store any personal names, IDs, uh, mobile numbers and, and um, with the data itself. Lime survey offers different options uh, of anonymization. But still, I mean, the main problem uh, when you look then at your data is that you might end up with a small sample size or looking at subgroups of, I don't know if you think about uh, sexual orientation, for example, uh, you know, these are usually not very large groups um, um, that then um, if you even publish the results uh, in aggregated form, it is quite easy to uh, identify or think about, you know, who could be the ones that have answered there. So be really sure to double check, you know, uh, how small the subgroups get when you analyze, especially from an intersectional perspective, your data. And it might be then in the end, the only option uh, that you actually don't include the frequency tables and the cross tabs uh, for this analysis. You can still talk about um, the results and insights and what you propose based on this, but it might be uh, in the interest of, you know, not to include uh, this uh, data in particular. Uh, you might also apply a rounding strategy, for example, you know, you can suppress averages if they are below seven people, for example, um, or percentages that are fewer than 22 individuals. Uh, these recommendations are taken from the UK Higher Authority for Statistics. And um, so there, there are a couple of recommendations out there that you can follow in this sense is like a, a rules of thumb in order to, you know, when it's safe to include this data and when it should rather be uh, not included in, in even in aggregated form. Okay, so let's then uh, with these two warnings or two recommendations um, put out there, uh, let's get a little bit more into the technicalities. Um, Lime survey has different options for exporting uh, your data. So you can export data to SPSS, Excel, and R, or just a comma separated value file. Um, there's also Stata and, and uh, HTML. So it offers a variety of formats that you can, can work with. Um, later on, I will show you how to do this for R. Uh, I haven't worked in particular with SPSS. One issue that I detected while uh, working with Lime Survey that SPSX, SPSS or Excel work reasonably well. However, the issue is a little bit uh, with the multilingual uh, questionnaires. So there is a bug in Lime Survey, which is actually filed that uh, even if you choose to export um, uh, your results and the labels in not the default language, which is English in Nagea, you know, it always exports it in English. So there's a little bit uh, an issue with that. Uh, I made a, um, uh, a workaround on this in R that you can really uh, create a data set 
uh, with the labels in each language in which you launch the survey, but uh, this well, requires uh, additional steps. Well, I'll show you later on how to do this. Another important thing is once you download the data, you know, you really need to safely store it. Um, and this is relatively easy depending on the format. Uh, I'm not sure about SPSS, but if you download an SPSS file to your computer, and let's say you store it on a USB drive, I think anybody who has this USB drive can look at the data. So it's not specially protected. I might be wrong here. I don't know, since I don't work with SPSS, if you can really um, store the data in an encrypted format, but I don't think so. Um, in Excel, it's easier. So you can just, you know, if you download the data in Excel, you can just uh, save the file with the password, which means that any, if you lose the USB drive, for example, where you store it, uh, you know, people can't, can't look at the data. The same works for, for R, where you can store this um, file in a password protected mode. Uh, there is actually the best way to do this if, I mean, let's say it's like this, if you have an Excel file and if you work on the analysis of your data uh, and you protect it with a password, you know, you still have to send around the password in order for other people to open your file. Uh, another and more advanced way to do this is really to encrypt the data with a key, with a public and private keys, which then allows you to um, share your data uh, in an encrypted format without the need to really uh, send around passwords in plain mode via email or anything. So I think this I would really recommend and there are specific tools to create those encryption keys, personalized en encryption keys. I've put the one on Windows. If you work on Linux, you're probably you know more familiar with this anyway because it's quite incorporated in the operating system. Um, so it's, this is just to make sure, of course, I mean, if you store it on your computer and your computer's password protected, normally it's, it's, it's okay, but it's like you add an additional layer of security if you encrypt uh, the result data set as well and protect it with a, with a password. Uh, the disclosure control, this is what I said, you know, you have to be really careful with the confidentiality. You know, if you get to small sample sizes, then, um, even when you publish the aggregated format, you know, people potentially can be identified. So we'll be careful with this. Okay, so how does the data look like? Um, well, it looks like any data matrix. There is not really anything, um, anything particular about it. Um, so you get the columns, which are the variables. You will recognize here uh, the questions question codes, for example, SDEM 016, which asked about the highest qualification of respondents. And you see them there, there's like university doctorate or prefer not to say the response items then are one respondent per row. I mean, this should be not really anything uh, new, just that you see how the data look like. And it depends a little bit as well uh, when you export when you export uh, on, on the type of data that you export, um, if the labels already in there, if you see the labels, uh, the answer labels in the result data set or just the answer codes. I will later on explain a little bit more also how this is dealt with in, in, in more detail. So which tools are out there in order to start with the analysis? Um, as I said, SPSS, of course, I mean, this is pretty standard for, for social scientists. Many people work with SPSS and it might come pre-installed in your university. So you have a license and you can just use it. Others look with uh, Microsoft Office or LibreOffice uh, Excel file. The, it's, it's quite, you know, the good thing is that it's uh, available to almost every, anybody. It's easy to access. But uh, when we talk about the, the Excel, you know, the statistical analysis, it's, it's a little bit cumbersome. It's not really a tool, you know, specifically designed for running the analysis. In the same way, SPSS, um, if it's a, a professional tool, 
But what I found difficult as well is often when you do the, the pre-processing of your data and the re-aggregation, you do this with scripts. I mean, you can do it with SPSS, but uh, as well, I will show you later on, uh, there are other solutions like R and R Studio, which is much more easier and, and straightforward. Um, as I already mentioned, I think most of the things that we've done for the GAM in terms of the reporting template, but also the manuals, and the analysis handbook is actually run in, in is done in R. It's a very uh, powerful and integrated environment, um, which is not only limited to maybe, you know, later on doing certain cross steps, but it's really a universe of all different types of analysis that you want to do. It's very versatile and there's nothing that you can't do. I mean, the main drawback here is that it really has a very steep learning curve. So if you're not used to uh, programming, if you're not used to work with uh, code, uh, it's, uh, it takes quite a long while to, to get familiar with it and uh, to you know, achieve what you want to do in a reasonable amount of time. Because the main drawback there is that there's not really a uh, user interface where you can click together your analysis like in SPSS. So everything is code based, which makes it very vers versatile, but it also, you know, requires a lot of investment in time and really get to working with this. So uh, my recommendation would be here to find someone who knows this a little bit, who can help you and who can translate what you want to do in, in code as well. There's, our, however, an, an other alternative as well, which is called JASP. You might have seen it. It's like an alternative to SPSS. It uses R under the hood, but it provides a more user-friendly approach uh, to doing the statistics. Um, because here again, similar to SPSS, you can click together your analysis and uh, what you do, what you want to do. Uh, I think what often gets neglected or not so much uh, thought about is that actually for the analysis, uh, a lot of work needs to be done in cleaning the data and doing the, the pre-processing. And uh, this makes it, um, is, is one further um, advantage, let's say, of R and the, the R Studio uh, environment because uh, since everything has to be done in code and written down it also provides you immediately uh, a history of all the transformations that you apply to your data uh, this is important because later on you might think you know how did it arrive at this aggregated variable and how has this been calculated of course if you write this down in a script you know it's there it's documented and ideally each time you process your data, let's say you start from the downloaded raw data matrix and you transform it into the format you need, you do the corrections and, and then you can uh, carry out the analysis. So it's a very transparent and reproducible way of uh, how you get from your uh, survey results to uh, your analysis. And uh, this needs to be done in any case for your data as well. So for example, you want to do some sanity checks uh, for the date of birth. Uh, this is an open text field, as you might remember. So people can just enter their, you know, uh, I don't know, data that not necessarily makes sense. I mean, there are some, some checks built in that the date has to be at least from 1920 and uh, it has to be an integer. So, but still, you know, sometimes the, the, the data doesn't make sense and you want to detect uh, these entries and, and uh, even correct them uh, if you can. The same holds for salary, for example, you know, people entering uh, incredible amounts of salary. So you want to do some sanity checks uh, on, on, on for some respondents. Then usually the pre-processing also involves uh, to build uh, new variables. So for example, what we do in the reporting template is um, to create a new variable, which is called care responsibilities, where we put together the care responsibilities for dependent adults. 
and if you are a parent. So, um, and we just make this into a, a Boolean, a, a logical variable. So if you have care responsibility, no matter for adults or children or not, which then can be used for, you know, cross tabs or in, in further downstream analysis. Um, also, you might want to do to regroup uh, variables and define certain ranges for age, for example. Um, this can also work for salary, for example, and, and to document all those changes and, and, that, and modifications that you do, it's, you know, uh, it's good to, to have the script who really carries this out. The pre-processing that we provide in the reporting template also includes um, to generate the different data sets for each language that you carried out the survey. So if you have a survey in English and in German, let's say this will produce two data sets, which then can be used in the reporting to generate the graphics containing uh, the risk corresponding uh, responses and questions in the corresponding language. So once you've done with a, with a data cleaning and pre-processing, as I said, we have, we have um, prepared this reporting template. Of course, you're free to use this also based on SPSS or Excel or anything that you want to do. Um, but the reporting template, what it does basically, it takes the initial data matrix uh, and it will produce you, it will give you uh, a chart and a frequency table for, for each question. And in some cases, it will also produce already a, a crosstalk for uh, gender and the answer options in a, in a of this specific question. Later on, I will show you how to set it up and how to run this in order to see, you know, that it's not really that complicated and to take a little bit the, 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 the spine out of this uh, code and R in our studio uh, thing. Overall, you will see that there are, you know, on the descriptive level, there are uh, four different types of, of data in variables. So on the one hand, of course, it's categorical, uh, where you have, uh, for example, gender, you know, the responses for gender, um, you can see here. Then, of course, yeah, the Likert scales, these are all the questions where people rate, you know, how strong they agree or disagree with certain uh, items and sub-questions. Um, what you see here is the Likert scale, you know, how this will, the chart that this will produce. So you have on the left side, of course, uh, sub-question items and then uh, color-coded um, the, the, the answers and uh, the quantities for the answers. Then, of course, there is numerical data, for example, salary or um, um, age as well. Uh, also, we don't do, don't do any regression lines or anything. This is just an example, you know, to indicate that, you know, this is uh, the numerical data that we have in the survey as well. And then the report will also produce um, some cross tabs, as I already mentioned, where we look at, for gender and specific uh, question response, for example, a type of contract, permanent or temporary, and, and stuff like that. So this is really some very simple cross tabs that are also included. And once you have this, once you have the report, I think this is really then the time to get everybody together at the table and start, you know, looking at what this all means. I mean, uh, this might involve just, you know, to simply look that certain responses uh, don't make any sense, <laughs> that they don't make any sense or they don't uh, fit to the expectations that you might have or other people working in your organizations and then you know, generates um, new questions, how this could be interpreted, and you might find yourself in the situation that you need to talk to, to certain people or, or, or groups, you know, um, in order to dig a little bit deeper and see what this, what, what it really means. Um, what, what you then can do probably is, um, you know, also think about uh, where you would expect the differences inside your organizations. For example, if there are different faculties participating, you might want to group uh, always, you know, considering that you really have 
included a question that allows you to make these uh, different groupings in, in the questionnaire. You might want to group the results according to faculty. I mean, there are definitely going to be differences uh, between the computer science faculties and uh, an educational or ped uh, faculty of, of pedagogy. Um, this might apply to department, but also the prof professional profiles uh, of among the respondents. So, you know, um, and this is really where it comes in, the whole importance of the context comes in, because of course, if you work in your organization, you might already have certain ideas or intuitions what, where to look for, for differences and important insights uh, from the survey. And then, of course, you can check this, you know, usually if there are any differences in terms of gender and the other intersectional categories, for example, in terms of age, of course, uh, ethnic minority, um, sexual orientation. So, you know, you can start exploring this and then you could also think about uh, more advanced models that uh, could be carried out so there are some more um, there are some more um, uh, dependent variables which you could use for example job satisfaction or the motivation that uh, people indicate in the survey so you could try to you know, uh, model what predicts really the job satisfaction in, inside your organization. And then you can use anything from, I mean, the type of contract they have, um, you know, to the microaggression, aggregate some items from the microaggression scales and try uh, to build some more advanced models. But again, um, I think it's really important that on the one hand you have people from the overall organization there, and then someone also who understands really uh, statistics and what can be done in order to make uh, really valid uh, models and uh, a valid analysis. Okay, let me also just briefly mention to you uh, something that has been, uh, that was a question during the last session as well, the sustainability of all this. I think what, what, what is quite clear for now is that uh, we try, you know, that the whole GAM framework and everything that it contains is uh, designed in a way that is really easy to share. I mean, this is, this is the spirit of this thing, that it's a, it's, it's a collaboration, that people can use it, adapt it, uh, you know, but then also hopefully contribute maybe um, new insight. This holds especially also for, for the analysis where you in your team, you might come up with a very interesting type of analysis that you run. And uh, there is then really, I would invite everybody you know, to, to get back and, and contribute this analysis that we then can uh, integrate in the analysis handbook, for example, that others can uh, use it in, in, you know, and, and try it out in their own uh, context. So the way this is done basically is, uh, is through GitHub. It's again, it's a quite technical, technical thing. GitHub comes from the development of software and it's a platform basically to, to, to do distributed development of, of software and contribute to it. But since we use basically code for for doing the reporting template, for the analysis tem template and everything. I mean, it makes sense to use this platform. And the way it, it's structured, you can just, you know, either download the code, but then also it's it's quite easy to, um, to send how it's called a pull request um, so that any contribution can be easily integrated into what's already online and, and there. And I really, I want to, you know, I would invite you to, to, to take a look at this, and uh, I think it can be quite powerful uh, for for really collaborating and and making this uh, whole thing in a in a very open, in a very open uh, manner and fashion. Uh, currently, there are, there are really three three repositories, and I'm going to show you. These, it's uh, the documentation. The documentation itself is written in, in R and it's online. We have made this reporting template uh, that you can use and we are currently working on the analysis handbook. 
which is forthcoming as well. And then, of course, there's the game questionnaire itself, but you know, you can access it uh, online. And we're going to be putting out a Word version of this as well with all this online <laughs> environment. This is our weak point so far. We don't really have a Word version, but it's going to be online and it, uh, it makes it easier, I think, to have an overview of the whole thing as a as a, you know everything together in in, in one place um, okay so this was a first some of the things that i wanted to say where it's like 10 35 i think it's fine um, so let me show you quickly how you can work with the conditions if you want to hide and show question question sections or even uh, specific sub questions it's not really that complicated either let me again uh, share my screen so i'm here in uh, my questionnaire i'm in the structure section and let's say i want to show and hide question 004 WC JC 004 which is about which of the following best describes your post I mean as you remember this is a question that you ideally would need to provide your own uh, answer categories because they are very specific to your organization but let's say you know you only want to ask these questions if the respondent is uh, uh, an academic so you know the sub questions you would provide here they are about academic different academic type of uh, positions and you only want to show this question really when someone is an academic so in order to to this then refers us back to the first question in the section about your current job which is wcjc001 what is your current position in the organization you work for there we have three answer options which is academic researcher technician and administrative they have a1, A2, A3. And basically, what we need to do is, in our question four, set the condition that only if the response is A1 here, um, then it should be shown, and otherwise it should be uh, hidden. So what we do, we go back to our question that we want to hide or show. And basically, you have now two options to do the same thing. One is you write it directly here in the condition. You see the condition, it says one here, which is basically it's true. This condition is true and it's shown. And you can either now write the conditions if you know it or you copy it directly into here or you can click it together. And the way to do is you go, you switch from the question editor to the question overview. And once you are on the question overview, you have here the condition designer. So you click on the condition designer, which brings up uh, this screen where you have on the one hand, the questions and the answer types. And now you just select the question, which you know provides the condition. Uh, WC JC001, what is your current position in the organization? And you select, well, it needs to be A1 academic researcher. Okay. So you say you add this condition. Now it appears up here, default scenario, the question da equals academic researcher A1. Okay. We save and close it. And now, well, it, 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 it's a little bit confusing because you get back to the settings. But if you now go back to our question, you see now here that what you click together has been translated into uh, a code or the condition. So it's the code of the question, WCJC001. Then there is this NAOK which is basically the attribute of this question of the answer code, which is A1. As you remember, A1 corresponds to academic searcher. Okay. The thing is, if you click it together, you can't edit it now here. So you can't 
it's like protected. Um, so this is fine. And now you can basically preview the question group. And you see that there is now the, the question on the, on the academic role is hidden because it only will be shown once you select here the academic researcher. You see, then it is appear here the question. If we choose something else, technician, for example, it disappears. It's quite quick, maybe a little bit hard to see, but this, this is the way how it works. Okay. All right. Now, the logic is always the same. If you want to hide a que an entire question group, it basically works according to the same thing. The only thing that changes is for question groups, you can't use the condition designer. Don't ask me why, but uh, at least I haven't found a way to do it on the question group. So you have to copy basically the code that you have and put it in the, in the uh, corresponding field. You also will see now, this is our question where we have now the condition. So you see now that this is changed. Usually before there was a one, always indicating, you know, this is always true. And now it refers to this specific uh, question with this answer. And of course you can then combine this with any other um, condition answer. And if you've seen, we go back to the condition designer this is not just about the answers that are predefined, but you can also use, um, if you want to integrate here a, a constant, so it has to be a specific value always. For example, uh, think about age, or salary, you know, you want to have a specific number, numeric value, you can use it here. Uh, also, you have uh, the participant, participant fields. So uh, this requires that you create a participant table. So it cannot be done in an anonymous mode, your, your, your questionnaire, your survey, but it has to use the um, participant table. And then you could, for example, define a condition here that uh, only certain language codes will see, uh, I don't know, maybe a country specific question or, or anything like that. So, I mean, the whole thing is, is quite flexible. Any information that exists in the platform basically can be used to design and, 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 and channel your respondents to, to questions, sections, uh, whatever. Okay. Um, let me show you how you do this for a whole question group. So let me see if I can copy this here. So I copy the same condition basically from this. And now I want to only show for example, the working conditions question group, you see here, this is working conditions, recruitment and promotion. I only want to show this uh, when the respondents is again, academic stuff. And this is basically done through the relevance equation. So for questions, it's called condition here, it's called relevance equation, but it works the same way. You just copy the uh, condition in here Let's save it. And this means if someone selects now academic, um, uh, academic researcher, they will see recruitment and promotion. If they choose something else, they will jump right away to training. And uh, the thing to test this now is you actually have to preview the whole survey because it, it in, involves uh, a jump from one section to the next. So we can't just view preview the question group. We have to preview the entire survey. Let's do this. We need to check the data agreement. So let's go to uh, about your current job. Uh, about your exactly. Let's not fill in socio demographics. So let's about your current job. We say, okay, I'm a technician which means I shouldn't see the question group on promotion. Okay. We need to, in order to advance, I need to fill in the rest of the stuff as well. So, and then when I click next, I should be put directly to training and we skip now all the questions that were contained in the promotion. 
So, I mean, uh, it's basically, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same logic. And whatever condition you want, you can then uh, include in this section or there is also, um, let's see, I mean, the three places where you, you can uh, insert conditions are for the question, the question group. And let me show you, let me show you can also show and hide uh, sub items. Let's see one here. Uh, sub questions. Apparently, ah, here we go. So this is a sub question. Please indicate how helpful each of the following was in facilitating your return to work after parental leave. And you see now we have here sub questions, keeping in touch with the institution while away, which there is now also a sub condition, which has uh, an error. Well, this is something that we have to look with, uh, Sergi, because it's uh, uh, when you edit this, it works in the original version, but when you edit it, there's some doesn't copy all the condition here. So there should be here a a four, I think, is it? So you can insert and hide and show specific sub questions just in the same way. And the logic of here was that you only need to indicate or rate how helpful a certain uh, measure was if you really have used it in uh, if you have if you used it which is ask in a previous question I think it's like the 11 11 B this is where we ask about have you used it and only if you've used it then we ask how helpful was it was it so these are the three different uh, places where you can work with conditions. Okay, if there are no questions on the conditions, I also wanted to show you quickly how to use the reporting template. Jörg, sorry, just, just one thing uh, that sometimes is a little bit confusing, maybe um, when, when we start by um, editing the questionnaire, is that um, every time that uh, you change or edit something into the questionnaire and you want to preview it, uh, um, you, have, uh, you cannot uh, refresh the preview survey uh, every time you change something. You have to uh, generate a new preview yeah. Um, okay, this is this is something that that we have to to keep in mind <clears throat> because sometimes we we make changes and we we cannot see them on the preview, uh, and this is because uh, we 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 have to generate a new one. We cannot uh, just refresh the preview. Okay, that's yeah. all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the way to work with this is also, you know, just to open it in tabs and then close the tabs in your browser and, and yes. Yeah, thanks. Okay, um, let's get back, share a screen. Okay, what you see here now is, um, is the GitHub account of, of the project, Act on Gender. And you see we have different repositories, different codes. So one is you know, the, the version of the Lime survey that we use, but then you have here the manual. Um, basically the manual that you see online is here, uh, the GAM report and the GAM analysis, which is still empty. So in order to use the reporting template, you go to the GitHub account and basically you download all the code. There are some instructions down here as well, but basically you download uh, the code as a zip file. Let me do that. And um, you just, you know, unzip it on your computer and maybe you want to change the name. Okay, 
GAM report demo. And then um, you need to open our studio. If you don't have it, uh, it's an open uh, editor for working with R. You download it, you install it, of course. I mean, you have to download and install R and everything that comes with it. But there are so many tutorials out there. I think you know this is uh, fairly straightforward. So you open our studio. And basically, uh, the first thing is that you define a new project for your report, which keeps track of, you know, it, it uh, keeps track of uh, the, the, the path and that uh, all the files will be found. So let's just do that. We make a new project and we choose uh, the one, the GAM report demo that we just um, downloaded and we create a project. Okay. So you see now here, this is the environment of uh, the R Studio, and you see now here all the files on the bottom. This might change a little bit depending on how you have set up your, your R Studio thing, but basically it shows you all the files on the right hand side that are used to produce your report. And there are like two basic um, configurations or things that you have to uh, edit. One is the config sample. You have to, you know, rename it and uh, make it into the config. And if you open it, if you click it, you see here the config file. And basically, you need to just insert here the ID of your survey. Because when you later on download the data, this is the idea that comes by default by, by Lime Survey. And in this case, in the data that I use, it's uh, the ID, and you see it when you browse your your online. So you, when you browse your questionnaire, you, it says it in the title. So mine is four seven seven four six three. Okay, you save it, and then the other file that you need to um, edit is the inside the utility folder. It's called the preprocess LL. LSSR. And this file, basically what it does is um, it extracts the label and prepares uh, the data in a correctly labeled matrix. So we also need here the, the survey ID. And you see here also there's all if you have, if you want to encrypt your data with your private key, this is where you put in your key ID. And then it will already store um, your data in an encrypted format so that also only you can open it. OK, so what we have to do now is with these steps uh, is actually download the data. And let me show you how you do that. I use here the data that we we have set up uh, a game here to generate data for ourselves, you know, where we fill in respond just just to try things out. And basically, you have to download or export two things. One is the survey uh, archive file. As I said, it's, it's a good way to export this anyway, uh, because it's a backup file, which allows you to later on import your survey in any other Lime survey platform. So this is really um, also if you edit something and you know things don't work out and it, it becomes a mess, you can delete the survey and import this, go back to a previous version, for example. So it's always a good idea to export the uh, survey file. And this is done here under Settings, Display Export. And it's the first option, Survey Structure LSS. So we export this. OK, it's downloaded. And then we also uh, I want to export the responses. Of course, you need to uh, have activated your survey first and generated a few responses because otherwise no data will be there and actually the button here will be uh, inactive. So responses and statistics gets you to this screen here where you see the summary, which is this screen. Display responses uh, allows you basically to see you know, the data as it comes in. You see we have here 26 responses, and this is the start of the, um, of the field. So there's an ID, a seed, last page. This is the last page you see here where people have visited. 
and then it also indicates you already if they are completed or not as you can see here so it's quite easy actually to filter here yes or no and see only the completed ones or all of them yeah the start language uh, you know start date last date action um, and so on so this might depend a little bit also on your settings for Lime survey if it's more or less anonymized if you do you know if you completely anonymize it uh, these dates will not exist at all 1980 for example and uh, yeah you can also uh, you know enter data yourself here this in some cases is useful uh, you can do some basic statistics, but I don't want to go in, into this because it's quite uh, complicated. Um, and with what we're aiming for with the reporting template, it's anyway, um, if you want to do the analysis, you need to do it outside of, of Lime survey. There's also the timing statistics, as I said uh, before. So, for example, you know, it, it tells you here how many seconds people are spent on a specific page. And then what we really want to do is uh, the export here where you have uh, export responses or export responses to SPSS. SPSS as the most common package used for the analysis is like you know a top level entry here so you export it to SPSS but if you want to use it in our R environment you need to go to this page where you can see there's a whole range of different options formats for, for exporting so there's the Microsoft Excel html pdf words data so these are the different formats uh, you can you can try out what we need for our reporting templates is the r data file and we use a tab field separation this in the end it's a it's a normal uh, comma separated well tab separated value file it's not nothing really uh, particular the headings um for our particular case, we just need the question code because we are gonna manually in, in the reporting template, what it does, it you know creates the correct label depending on the language file you wanna use. So um, in our case, it's just question code. But for example, if you do your exporting for Excel, you might wanna use uh, you know abbreviated or full question text because then this is really the way that you can see the question, the questions uh, inside inside your file. Otherwise, it's just going to be uh, underlying codes, and you don't know what they mean. There are a couple of um, um, additional um, settings for for our purpose. We can leave this here. Here under the export settings, again, here's you know the completion state, all responses or not. It's quite easy. And then you can select here the export languages, but this is really a little bit misleading because you want to use another language, but it's always going to be in English. <laughs> so this is a bug they have to fix. Let's see. Um, there's the range from 1 to 26. And then again, the responses. There are similar options in terms of just the codes or the full answers. If you uh work with excel you probably want the full answers because then they are already correctly labeled for our case it's really the answer codes because again we extract the answer labels and the question labels from our survey archive file depending on the um depending on the language we want to use and then of course here you can uh sub make a sub selections of specific variables if you want in this case we we use all of them. Okay, so we export this file. And I basically have now downloaded the two files here, the survey file, and you now see here's the ID again of your survey and the, the, the structure, the archive. And let me just copy it now into my reporting folder. There's a data folder which is called data raw. And I put it in here. And now I'm ready to go into uh, the reporting template again and basically run the preprocess LSS file. So this is done if you do it here with the source. 
it reads the data from uh, the data file that I downloaded and it, it extracts the labels from the archive file and puts the two things together and saves a matrix where you have uh, you know the variables according to their type so there's the numerical labels but then there are the categorical labels which already contain uh, you know the answer labels the correct answer labels this takes a little while because this version has like for uh, five different languages and it needs to extract all this and uh, but then it's done um, basically it has stored in the data folder remember there's now the df the id the language and the r data file so this is stored now here if you want depending on the languages that are available if you want another language file so you change in the pre-process the language code source it again and then it will generate uh, another um, data file which contains now the same data but with the German labels of course when you install this for the first time there are some libraries that needs to be installed but our studio now is sufficiently smart let's say uh, that it will show you these requirements uh, of of the additional packages that need to be installed okay so now we have here the uh, the german ones and for any other languages that you've used in your survey you can generate these files okay to generate the report you go to the index file and basically, uh, it's a combination of uh, plain text and code. So these are the code sections here, and this is the text. And the only thing that you need to do is now you specify in the config file in which language you want, which language uh, data file you want to use. And let's make it in English. So let's leave it like this. And you say now build. And I want an interactive format. And if everything runs well, it should uh, it will produce you um, an HTML file site with all the frequency tables and the charts. Uh, this is gonna it's gonna take a while, um, but I mean the idea is since we know. And this, you might remember when I told you in, in the first time, you know, the question codes, don't change the question codes. If you change the question codes, uh, this script will not find uh, the data and will not know what to do with it. So it will just ignore it. This holds, of course, also for any other question that you add to it. It will not be part of this reporting template because we don't know which uh, question it is. Okay, so it's finished. And now you have here, um the result where you see the different sections of uh, our questionnaire for example working conditions you can now click on the working conditions about your current job and you see here um all these uh, headings and the labels there are in english and these will change if you use another language file right so for all questions you have now a chart a basic chart and a frequency table and in this case even a basic cross tab you know are you a man or woman academic researcher technician administrative of course since we only have 28 responses so i mean this is not really but but it shows you how it works right so um and so on and so forth and if we go to parental leave for example there should also be some Likert scale here, for example, so please indicate availability, the options, and it will uh, give you the Likert scale. This is the interactive format, but you can also generate this thing in Word. So you go again to build uh, the book and you choose Word document, and it will generate um, the same with, but in Word for you. The thing is, if you are used to work with, with R, uh, you can actually, you don't have to use Word, but you can uh, work with this directly here and make this a more interactive session. So 
I open, for example, the section on sociodemographic variables, you see here that there is the code, and then you ideally start writing directly the interpretation or whatever you, you have for your specific data inside this file, and then you can generate the entire report, really including a more specific interpretation uh, that you want to, to make. You can also, I mean, this also works in an interactive manner. So you execute this directly here and you see the data, how it looks, and then uh, do the analysis. Okay. So you see now here, this is now finished and it has generated the report for you, which there are some, you know, generic text sections that we introduced, but of course you are free to change them, of course, in your own copy and instance. Okay, and it starts with the dropout pages, so where people dropped out, and then the submission languages, people responded here in, in, in German, English, and Spanish, and then the sociodemographics, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, this saves you a lot of time. If you can really use it, it saves you a lot of time to generate, you know, uh, the basic descriptive statistics, and then gets you up on speed, let's say, putting this on a table with your team and start really looking in more detail what the data means, interpret it, and then do maybe some follow-up analysis. Okay, let me stop here. I mean, I understand that this is quite, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging if you don't, if you're not familiar with R and R studio and your thing, but maybe you get a student from your biostatistics department, or I don't know, you know, get someone who is a little bit more familiar and they will be able to uh, help you uh, and, and generate these reports, I think in a relatively short amount of time. Okay, so this is more or less what I wanted to, to show you. The idea of the Gale Manual is to help you with all the steps that you need to set up and launch the survey. We're gonna use then the, the analysis handbook uh, once you have the data. But this analysis handbook is not, not ready yet, but we hope it should be ready by mid June because this is when we do a training for the people who've run their surveys. And uh, we have a small work group, you know, to, to do some exemplary analysis based on this, on this manual. And this manual will then have at least uh, the links that you need to get started installing R, R Studio and stuff like that, and uh, how to set up the basics. I mean, it was the only way for us to make it work uh, for many you know, uh, organizations really carrying out the survey and helping them in, in getting the descriptive statistics relatively fast. So I think this was the best way for us. And luckily also because uh, when we started, we didn't really know that there was this bug in Lime survey regarding the language files. So uh, we had to do then like a small improvisation in order to, you know, make manual it is matching of your, your data with the whatever language origin you have used. You can also, I'm not sure, I mean, maybe you want to try it out in SPSS. I'm really not so familiar with SPSS. If you can, if how this works with the different language files and let me know, because the other option is also that via R, you export then the correctly labeled data matrix to SPSS. This is also an option that should work. Might actually work better, so. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll need to see. And uh, yes, as Sergi said, you know, please use the mailing list or get in touch with us directly. Any questions, anything, let us know. And I hope you find it useful. And um, good luck. <laughs>